Hey everybody and welcome to another video from Electronic Armory. In this video we're going to continue our 3D game development course in Unreal and Blender and talk about 3D in depth. So let's get started. Now we can't talk about 3D without talking about the Utah teapot first. It was a mathematical model that was simple, it was solid, cylindrical, and convex. It was an easy 3D scene with a non-trivial model for a basic scene and light setup. This teapot shows up in a lot of pop culture 3D scenes, and so now that you know about it, you might spot it yourself. The Utah teapot was created in 1975 by Martin Newell, computer graphics researcher at the University of Utah. And an interesting fact is some of those guys that were on that team ended up going off and starting Pixar. So I want to introduce you to our cube. This is going to be our default object, essentially our Hello World application if you're a programmer. And so we're going to get started in 3D using this cube. First, we're going to lay out some 3D concepts for you really quickly. Now, modeling geometry, we call the geometry itself meshes. And those meshes are composed of vertices. And between those vertices, we connect them with edges. And multiple edges are then connected with faces. We're going to talk a little bit about lighting today, texture and materials, and then rendering. And this will set us up for creating models and texture and materials for 3D objects and assets that we're going to include in our Unreal Engine game. So let's start with vertices. Now you may be familiar with these, but let's define these to be clear what we're talking about. These are points that occupy a specific coordinate in space. In 3D space, the vertices have an X, Y, and Z coordinate. For example, 3, 4, and 19. So you can see in the image here that we have a highlighted vertice, and this cube is made up of eight vertices. In 2D games, we just have the X, Y coordinate. And even though Unreal is a 3D game engine, you can also make 2D games as well. So on this vertice, we have a Z axis, which is in blue. We have a Y axis and we have an X axis. And so this may be familiar to you, but I wanted to call out the fact that our Z axis is blue, green is Y, and red is X. Because this also corresponds to an RGB value which is also three values in a row. So R being red, G being green, and B being blue. We abbreviate that to RGB. And this corresponds again to the color code in RGB. And so I just have some Photoshop screenshots where we have the R value, the G value, and the blue value. And so you'll be seeing these values and these colors pop up here and there while we work in 3D. All right, so when we talk about edges, we talk about the lines between each vertice. And so in this image, we have our cube made up of exclusively edges. But of course, those edges are defined by vertices themselves. And then when we connect those edges, we create faces. And so everything on this image is now a face. We have three faces of the cube that are currently visible. And of course, the plane that the cube is sitting on is another face. That face catches shadows that are caused by the geometry or the mesh that is the cube. And these three basic components make up our model. So let's talk about modeling. Now to create certain objects, we actually have to create these objects with other geometry. And so we have a sphere in this example, and then some kind of Greek building here made up of pillars, a roof, and some steps. And this is in wireframe mode. And these wireframes are created of edges that again make up our geometry. So here's a very simple example of a sphere. And you can see how our geometry makes up this particular sphere. We have a bunch of faces that are kind of large. And so it makes the overall spherical effect not that great and kind of boxy or faceted. These facets can be reduced with smooth shading but the profile or the silhouette of the sphere is still pretty boxy, but the face of it kind of looks smoothly shaded. So this is one way we can actually fake some of the smoothness of our geometry by not adding more vertices. If we add more vertices, you can see that the sphere is indeed even smoother, but this is still flat shaded. If we go to smooth shaded, you can now see that it is almost perfectly smooth. However, here and there, there are some facets. And you might be familiar with this kind of effect in game engines, where the people that are creating the game have chosen to do a slightly reduced polygon count on our model because they don't want to have the computer computing all the different vertices. So here we have the same object with a lot more geometry to try to smooth this out even further. And it's not exactly perfect, but when you get to this point, it becomes very expensive to compute all these vertices just for a ball. And so there are ways that we can fake it, namely smooth shading, and we'll be showing you some other ways here in later courses. 
So an object in our game and in 3D can have different levels of details. So for efficiency, objects that are farther away can have fewer polygons and thus more faceted since they lack the detail needed on objects that are closer to the camera. And so the player doesn't necessarily notice the lack of detail because that object is so far away. When the object is closer, then you may want to swap that out for an object that has a higher level of detail. Game engines allow for different levels of detail on meshes for efficiency. And so we'll talk about that as we get into Unreal. But you might actually want to have this as a style in your game. Here's an example of a low poly scene that you might have as a, as a space adventure or something like that. Or maybe kind of a more cartoonish look to your game. And so this is perfectly acceptable to have low poly. And not only will this work really, really fast and efficiently for your game, but if it's going to be on mobile, it should just work out of the box without a whole lot of different optimizations. Let's talk about textures and materials that go on top of our meshes. So here's that Greek building that we have pillars and a roof and some steps. And we're going to put a diffuse material on this. Now this is one of the basic materials that we can place. And this is what was called a shader. And how the shader works in this particular case is it basically diffuses or spreads out light after it gets hit. As opposed to a gloss shader where the light comes in and bounces directly back out just like a mirror. And so now you can see on the sphere we have the reflection of the table or this, the plane that it's on top of. And so together we have the diffuse building and then the gloss sphere. And the gloss sphere is now reflecting that building that we have in front of it. So those are the two main shaders. And you can use different combinations of these to get different effects in your game. We also have an emission shader, which is essentially a light and it casts light and it creates light. And you can see what the effect of that looks like. We have another one called anisotrophic, and this one is going to be more of what metal does to light, and it kind of, when it hits the surface of it, it spreads it out, and you get this interesting effect. And you might recognize this as maybe the bottom of a smooth stainless steel pan or something like that. Now what if we want to apply some kind of image or texture to the object or the mesh? Well, we can do that as well, and I've done that with the roof, but on the steps, I've just applied a regular flat texture. So how do we go ahead and apply such an image? Well, we take the geometry and then we try to flatten it out against that image. And so you can see here in Blender, we have the, the Greek building on the right and its roof in 3D. And then we kind of flatten it here on the left on top of our image and how that works. And so the roof pieces where we have the top and the, the sides, those are pretty much rectangles and they flatten out pretty well. And then on the, on the ends for that roof, we have these triangle pieces. And so those are kind of up at the top left hand corner of our image. And this is called UV mapping. We are mapping a XYZ object to a UV, and that's the coordinate system UV as opposed to XY of our image. And so that mapping will translate into our Unreal game engine so that we can apply textures and materials to our game assets. So here's an example of an image texture on an object. Most of this material is just like a plastic material that I created, but his face is actually an alpha channeled PNG file where the glasses and the mouth are then UV mapped against his head. So that's another use of how we might use image textures in Blender and in our game engine. You can also create these textures procedurally. And so here's just a quick example where I'm using a a wave node to create a wave effect and mixing those together. And you can look at that a little bit more detail, but this is just for demonstration purposes. So it's not a real, a texture that we'd actually use. Next, let's talk about normal maps. And so what a normal map is, it's, it's going to define how the light bounces off of our object. And this will allow us to give the effect of added geometry where we don't necessarily want to add more vertices and edges. And we'll go into this in more detail, but I want you to see what a normal map is and recognize it. it's, a, it's a very purple image that looks very similar to the color map that we have on the left-hand side here. And so to define a normal map specifically, it tells the renderer to bounce light off of the surface differently than the geometry would normally. 
normals refer to the line perpendicular to the surface plane. So if you have a flat plane, that normal is going to be perpendicular, but the normal map tells that line to move in a slightly different direction. Now in almost all game engines, the back face of that plane is not rendered. This is the face opposite to the direction of the plane's normal. So sometimes if your objects are not showing up or certain pieces of your model are not showing up, it could be that your normals are flipped and that just means that the normal that is perpendicular to that face is facing in the other direction. So what does that look like? Now this is just a quick setup of a fence that I have and you can see that these little sticks and twigs, now each one of these faces that make up these sticks have normals and, the, and these aqua lines that are coming off of each face are the faces normal and so you can see how they, they face out. Now if they ever faced in toward the center of the stick, then again, our normals would be flipped. So we'll go into much more detail here in this course on normals and normal maps, but for right now, I just wanna give you an introduction to them so you know what they are going forward. Now with our normal map applied, you can see that the light kind of bounces off our roof in a slightly different manner than it did before. and looks a little less flat. Another thing I wanna talk about is ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion is a technique to approximate how light shines on different parts of an object's surface. We use ambient occlusion a lot when we want to kind of fake the, the lighting effect for certain objects in our scene, where we don't necessarily want to calculate all the different light bounces and whatnot on objects. What we can do to the object's texture is include ambient occlusion and when we do that we get these contact shadows that kind of give the effect that this is, has a little bit more 3d effect to it and again we'll talk about all this when we get into the unreal game engine here's an example of ambient occlusion on our main scene and you can see that it essentially brightens everything up however where the pillars contact the ground of our building you get these little contact shadows, and again, it's just trying to approximate how a light would bounce around this object to get that effect. Let's talk about roughness really quickly. And so in opposition to glossy, we can make our glossy shader slightly less or more rough. And on our sphere here, I've kind of mapped out these, these different rings around the object. And for our roughness, what I've done is I wanna make where it's white rough and where it's black glossy. And so let's see what that looks like. And so now you can see with the roughness how that affects the light bouncing off of it. And you can use this to make different materials in Blender and Unreal to get different metals and different levels of wear and tear on your objects. In Unreal, we have PBR textures, and at the basic level, we have a base color, and this is usually going to be an image, say some wood for a crate or the tiles for our floor. We have a roughness texture, which defines where on that base color it is rough, just like I showed you with the roughness in the previous slide. We have a metallic texture, which is very similar to the roughness in terms of where it defines where this material is metallic. And then we have a specular map that again defines where on that object it is going to reflect light. And so let's talk about lighting. The first light I wanna introduce you to is the point light. And I have an arrow here to actually show you where that point light is. It is coming right over the top of our building, right out of its peak. And it is just literally a point in space that's casting a light. And our objects in our scene are casting shadows. So pretty straightforward. We have a spotlight, which is more of a cone that casts the light, and of course that casts shadows as well. We have an area light, which is a little bit bigger than a point light, and it obviously has area to it. And you can see in our sphere that that area light is just a small square. And we make that size medium, so we make it a little bit bigger. And you notice that can, that changes in our scene. The scene seems to get dimmer, but that's just because our photons are spread out a little bit more. It also makes our shadows slightly softer. And then with a very large area light, it makes it very, very soft lighting. And so just as a comparison between all of them, I have a quick animation that I threw together. And so you can see that when it's small, the shadows are harsh. When it's big, the shadows are soft. And so if you're going with a particular mood or something like that for your game, 
you can determine what size lighting that you want to have in order to get that effect. So if you want just a soft, moody scene, you might go with a larger area light. If you want something that's very harsh and dramatic, harder lights and smaller area lights are going to give you that effect. Global illumination is just a way of globally illuminating or illuminating every part of our scene all together, all at once, from everywhere. So you can see within our building, there's light reaching there. Uh, there's light from the back, from the front. There are no shadows being cast necessarily outside of our normal ambient occlusion type lighting with the contact shadows. And one we're going to use a lot in our Unreal game engine is our sun lamp. Sun lamps shine from all points in the same direction, independent of where the sun lamp is physically located in our scene. The image on the left is shining toward the left while the image on the right is rotated 90 degrees and shining to the right. And so you can see how that shadow gets cast. Here's the angle of our sun lamp in Blender. And so you can see in the left hand image that that light is shining right over the top of our scene and hitting that sphere. And so that shadow is going to be cast behind our building. And then on the image on the right, it was rotated 90 degrees and it's shining toward the right. But based on the location of the sun lamp, you might think that the shadow doesn't change. But let's see that again. And here's our scene with how our lamp is set up. And so again, it doesn't matter where in physical space our sun lamp is. So you can literally put your sun lamp underneath your scene and the lighting would not change. The only thing that changed the sun lamp direction and how it casts shadows is again its rotation which way it's pointing. All right, let's talk real quick about rendering. Now when you render a scene, we use a camera and that camera has a focal length and within that focal length, all objects will be in focus and all objects outside of that focal length will be blurry. And so we can use this to have different effects in our game. And when we change up our camera, it is very similar to the way that real life cameras work. So if you wanna know more about that and get more into cinematic effects in your game, definitely study a little bit on cameras and focal length, sizes of lenses and how those, the size of that lens and the focal length affect how the image looks. And so when looking at our scene, we have a couple of different ways of looking at it. One is perspective. And with perspective, it looks like we would normally expect where things in the background get smaller. But another way of putting that is we have these perspective lines and these lines converge. Now this is a perfectly straight book, but in perspective mode, you can see that its lines are converging to a point out in space to the top left. And that's what you'd normally expect with 3D. But there's something else that we want to talk about, and that's orthographic mode. Now, orthographic mode, as you can see from the grid, these lines are parallel. So here's another scene that I showed you, and these lines never converge. So the trees that are in the far background are the same size as the foreground. And again, this is just a technique that you may or may not use in your games, but you need to be aware of it so that you can select the right method to have the right effect in your game. All right, so then finally, as the camera is rendering it, we have the vertex processing. This processes every vertex independently to determine location and color. Next, we have clipping and primitive assembly. This eliminates the shapes that are not seen by the camera because they're behind other pixels or faces. And then we have rasterization, which takes those primitives and makes it through the clipper to get translated into pixels on an image. Those images come in at 30 to 60 frames a second or more. And so then we do fragment processing to combine those rasterized fragments into a final image to display to the screen. Great, so that's our crash course into 3D. We touched upon a lot of different subjects here and there, and we'll dive into each one of those in depth when we talk about Unreal and Blender, and as we go from Blender to Unreal, and then create a game out of that. This method from going from 3D asset into our game engine and then spending a lot of time in our game engine with scripting and everything like that will be really helpful to you, and you can see how these games are put together. So look forward to the future videos. If you like this video and you want to see more, give it a thumbs up. And make sure you subscribe to see videos on 3D game development, 3D modeling, mobile development, electrical engineering, and everything else to arm yourself in the digital world. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.